Well, Happy New Year, Jen Gerson. Happy New Year, Matt. It's 2023 and I don't have pneumonia. We're in the future. Yeah, so like your ninth round of antibiotics finally took care of that bug, huh? <laughs> well, for now, the kid's back in preschool, so we'll see how what happens next week. You th- yeah, and it was always the little one bringing it all home, right? Oh, 100% it was, yeah, absolutely. But that's uh, parenthood for you. What do you do? Uh, sorry, I forgot to turn off my space here. That's going to, the background audio will pick that no, up. No, no, that's, that's fine. I mean, I do appreciate the first thing that you said when, when we uh, started this rec- recording was you actually look good, like, you know. Not like you're not dying. This is a big improvement. I mean, I, I said it in a way that was less insulting than that, but like, well, you know, yeah, I yeah, no, I wasn't insulted because I'm basically autistic and can't be insulted, but that's fine. No, I mean just for for the listeners out there, particularly the ladies out there, I wanna I wanna know I'm very smooth. I was like, Jen, you always look beautiful, but you look better. So it was my way of stressing <laughs> that you do seem to have uh returned to good oh. health. Um <laughs> So we agreed a couple of weeks ago that when we would uh, we would take a few weeks off, we would run our nice list, which was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with that. We run the naughty <laughs> list, also a lot of fun. That was a and, great idea, by the way. Uh, it it filled a need, uh, and then um, and then we take a week off. And this week was the week off. It's uh, Saturday as we film this. I think we're going to publish this probably Sunday afternoon to be my guess. And we uh, agreed that we would uh, do a quick little podcast when we came back to chat about what's been up. And I got to be honest with you, I feel a a debt of gratitude to the news gods because I don't feel like we missed much. Like there's always stuff to talk about, but I was worried because I I think we both needed a break. I was worried that some huge breaking story would drop on our laps and we would be compelled to come back to work. And there was a couple of things over the last couple of weeks. I think we could have written about it if we wanted to, but we didn't have to. Uh, no, we didn't. And not only that, but uh, I would say that we are both extremely eager to get back to work. Like we both are ready to chomp at the bit a bit. I think just the way that the vacations worked out, uh, they started a little later this year and then they ended later. Mm-hmm. Like my kid's not getting back to school until Monday, Same. Uh, which is the ninth, which is quite late. Oh yeah. Um, yep. So the last week I've been trying to um, be a mom and bond with him and do really cute stuff with him. And it's been adorable. And I'm just loving the bits. I have got the squishiest little adorable monster child in the world. And I just cannot wait to boot him back into school and get on with my life. It's going to be amazing. Um, As they get older, they get, easier like you know it's i'm at the the age with my kids where i can tell them daddy doesn't want to talk right now like love you guys but daddy mm. wants to just sit here and read this book go do something in a different part of the house and, they'll go, and okay. also the other thing i find with kids it's really interesting and i don't mean to ramble off about unrelated topics but like what the hell are you supposed to do with them like i can i can play with my kids for 20 minutes and be like all right we got the train doing thing but like i don't have the capacity to imaginatively connect with toys in the way they do so i can only sit there with like a train back and forth for so long before I, I'm like, okay, I need to go do something else now. Anything, anything else than this. I, yeah, no, I, I hear you. Um, you know, like it's, it's weird. Like I, 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 if I wanted to spend all day with children, I would have gotten into ECE or, or one of those fields like teacher, like being a teacher where I would spend all day with children and I'd love my children. I love spending time with them. But like video games with my kids, like I'll play NHL against yeah. my son. I'll play FIFA against my daughter because my daughter yeah. likes soccer more than hockey. Okay. It's bonding. You you know, you, you chirp them. They chirp you. It's mm-hmm. um, it's time spent together. My wife's always been a big believer in getting out of the house and doing things like whereas for me, when I'm on holiday, like there at one point during the break, my wife said to me, it's like, when's the last time you left the house? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> this is great. Um. I spend my entire professional life and when I'm working, my professional life tends to eat my life on deadlines, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I've got this column due at this time. I got this thing edited by this time. When I'm on the radio two hours a day, my time marks, it's the second. I have to be in at this second. I have to be out at this second. Going on holiday, I counter program that. It's like, Mm -hmm. I don't have anything that's scheduled. I'll do stuff. But I'll get up today and I'll be like, and what shall I do today? When shall I do it? Maybe I don't want to do anything. All I did this break was read novels, not even serious book, just trashy novels and watch movies. It was great. Sounds nice. Sounds nice. You know, I I, I need I need more of that structure in my life. I need more. I don't know. That's what I want to talk to New Year's resolutions, but 
I need to get, I need to, I need to start adulting again. I need, I need to adult. I'm desperate to adult. Anyway, this is a whole other side conversation. Therapy what are we going to the line? Yeah. Therapy hour. Anyway, let's not, let's not ramble on like we did in our highly unsuccessful last pod- podcast. Actually, um, you know what? it had completely normal listenership levels. Did it? Yeah. Which is listeners. We love you guys, but wow. You were committed. Yeah. Um, we appreciate that about you. <laughs> or um, bored. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what, what like news wise, I mean, I can talk about Alberta. Uh, the just transition stuff that has been oh, announced yeah. of the federal yeah, yeah, government. I saw that. that is going to be that. Oh, okay. So Smith and, and the UCP are setting themselves up for that to be one of their defining battles yep. um, ahead of the next provincial election. So depending on what is actually in that legislation, the Trudeau government could be absolutely handing Smith a gift, an opportunity for her to look um, uh, rational and necessarily assertive in the pursuit of Alberta's interests. So those are people who have been paying attention. This is legislation that uh, the federal government has promised in order to help oil and gas workers transition away from oil and gas into other types of jobs, mostly um, uh, clean energy jobs, which could be fine. It could be like $2 billion in a pot for uh, additional programming that will be used by our local universities to help people retrain to become um you know solar panel engineers or whatever like you know what i mean like it could be totally fine but if they're pair- pairing that with a really punitive emissions gap gap for ex- or sorry cap for example they could be structuring this as a carrot and stick scenario where they are forcibly pushing um alberta's oil sand sector and energy sector into the pit and then saying yes but we gave you two billion dollars in retraining yeah. so you know it depends on how they how they retrain this this is coming at a moment when, as we've talked about before, you have uh, a federal government that is uh, tired, that is uh, increasingly lost in its own bubble, that is increasingly unable to um, uh, uh, parse uh, legitimate dissent and criticism from bad faith dissent and criticism, mm-hmm. and uh, seems to be, because of these reasons, seems to be increasingly leaning on uh, more and more highly, highly ideological uh, legacy land pieces, landmark pieces that often are blowing up in their faces because it's just it's just out of touch with where I think a lot of people are on on many issues. C eighteen, C eleven. These are the internet regulation bills. Guns has been another issue. This is another potential issue where this could be. Hey, here's a nice, well intentioned pot of money from the federal government that will probably go mostly nowhere, but will maybe help with a couple of local programs. Yeah. Or this could be an absolutely catastrophic um, attempt to kill the oil sands essentially in order to help the federal government, you know, now cement its legacy on the way out. Um, And in the process, giving Smith and the UCP an absolute target to rail against, um, dooming uh, Notley in any kind of presence by the provincial NDP in the process. I don't know what the answer to that question is going to be. But it's one of those things that I think we should set up because it's going to be one of the defining sort of uh, potentially one of the defining conflicts of the year ahead. Other thing I was thinking we could potentially talk about, like I, do, I know it's a little bit oversaturated, but the Jordan Peterson stuff mm-hmm. is interesting. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be that there's an appetite for this. For those who haven't been paying attention, uh, Jordan Peterson has been, who needs no introduction, has been uh, railing on in his Twitter um, feed about uh, a complaint that he has been registered against him through the um, Psychologist Professional Association, essentially, mm-hmm. uh, again, about his his Twitter presence, his Twitter presence, which is sort of rather notoriously, I should say, uh, provocative at times. Uh, I did a quick scan through the tweets that were apparently uh, offside for the Professional Association. The only one that really stood out for me was um, uh, the one where uh, somebody is talking, uh, clapping back at Peterson saying something to the effect of overpopulation is the major peril of our time. And and, and Jordan Peterson says something to the effect of, well, you're welcome to leave any time. Kind of counseling suicide. I can see from a professional association dealing with psychiatrists why that one would be over the line. But at the same time, I don't think anyone reading that could credibly claim that Jordan Peterson was actually counseling suicide. I, I just don't think that that's a that that is a good faith read of that tweet. So, to me, I'm looking at the professional association. I'm like, you guys have selected a Kobayashi Maru here. Like, I don't see how 
how you win this. You've given Peterson an opportunity to revive what was, a, you know, frankly, a bit of a flagging star, a, a dying star kind of kind of public profile. Um, you've given him an opportunity to once again um, uh, uh, play the free speech warrior, to play the victim um, against overaggressive and punitive actions by professional associations to shut people down. And also, he doesn't give a shit if you take away his license. It's not even, as far as I'm aware, he's not even practicing. Like his income's not derived from this anymore. So like he has every incentive and opportunity to just say, nah, fuck you and fight you tooth and nail. And he will make himself a goddamn hero in the process. And he doesn't care if you take away the license. You have no leverage. It's a, as I said, it's a Kobayashi Maru scenario for them. So quick, I, yeah. I don't know. A couple quick yeah, replies. Like, First of all, for video watchers, look at the size oh. of this piece of Toborun. Like that's... I've already what eaten the trunk. Is that? It's it one looks of these, like a it's Toblerone, like a but I've already I've already bitten the, the top part of it off. Right. Um this is this is the good Monster. stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um you know I'm rambling when finally like you're shutting up and eating and I'm I'm going mm, on. Max. Um a couple, <laughs> couple quick points. First of all, I think I think um first of all, I'm very proud to hear you use Kobayashi Maru and use it. Oh, correctly. No. Like my little Thank trekkie you. heart beats it. Oh, no, I'm I'm here for you, man. I'm I'm not a I'm not a total anti Trek fan. Yeah, I uh, do for... watch it. I did watch almost. I I did have a bit of a crush on Marina Sirtis well, when doesn't? I was a kid. Oh yeah, yeah. Who did? Um, we'll talk anyway. about that off the air. Um, <laughs> so for for non Trek viewers and listeners, the Kobayashi Maru is a no win scenario. It's a ship named the Kobayashi Maru. And you can't rescue it. It's a training simulation. And it's impossible to save the ship. And the test is how you as a would-be captain cope with a no-win scenario. And I think there's a common theme between the two things you were just laying out there, actually, with um, hmm. with the two things. And I don't know if you want a common theme. Like You don't actually have to, to put them together. But the thing that jumps out at me in both cases, whether it's the liberals potentially overreaching with the uh, just transition stuff, and certainly with the uh, the regulatory body, I forget what it's called, but I know the one you mean, the College of, of yeah, it's the Ontario College of Psychologists, and um, we'll 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 get that right when we write it down. Nobody can really expect perfection when we're just shooting the shit. No, you get you get eighty percent of my best tops um, <laughs> on, on a Saturday podcast. Um, in both cases, don't do your enemies a favor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and like. I don't, I don't know if Jordan Peterson is in decline or not. I don't really pay that much attention to the guy. When he became a phenom a few years ago, I went, oh, okay, interesting. Canadian academic making big intellectual waves. So I read some of his stuff and I watched some of his lectures. And I came away from it just going, what the fuck? Like, I, I, he, he completely captivated certain people in the way that certain people will get like really into a band. And I listened to the band. I'm like, this is just not doing it for me. So mm-hmm. um, Peterson then became very controversial and polarizing. And I just basically made a very conscious decision. I was just going to ignore all that. He, 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 is, he is the culture war. It's just basically yeah. what he is. He's a, he's a particular sub tranche of the culture war. And, I, and I, to the extent possible, I always ignore culture wars. I focus yeah, on real and, and so I, and like, you know, we yeah. don't over talk about George Jordan Peterson on, on, on oh, the line just because like, but we also like he's overexposed, man. Like I, I, there's, there's going to be a 1500, I mean, the entire national post today was, it was, it was a, 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 a fanboy missive to Jordan Peterson. Like this yeah. guy is not undercovered. Okay. Pierre Polyev already has uh, Jordan Peterson videos out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and Jordan Peterson interviewed uh, Danielle Smith. So it's like, I don't think it's good to ignore what he's putting out there. Um, and I would say this is that um, I started to get start, start when I the Jordan Peterson got famous. I too watched the lectures, and I would say I think he's a really, really strong lecturer. I think that you know if you took this guy's class as, as your first year psychology class at U of T, you would have loved the guy. Like mm. he's 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 an excellent lecturer, and I would even go forward to say I bet you he's actually a really good clinician. I'm willing to bet that if you had issues going to him before he got famous and weird, of course, but if you had issues and you went to him he would probably be able to help you with your issues. Like I, I, I have full faith in those two things. Um, I do think that there is a Jordan Peterson, while well, same type of thing is like, there are people who get just super captivated by the guy. There's also a Jordan Peterson joy oh, yeah. entrance syndrome oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is just like, you guys have made this dude out to be a Nazi that I don't see where you're coming from here. Like yeah. uh, that just doesn't seem, I think that essentially this is a guy who got sort of accidentally famous by refusing to state to to comply with pronouns 
Um, and in the process, he sort of incidentally became a sub tranche of the culture war and decided yeah. to, to roll with it. And as a result, like, I don't think anybody really sees the guy very clearly f- for his flaws or his um, potential upsides. Like, I think that it's impossible to have an almost unbiased opinion of the dude. Um, it's it, which is a really interesting thing. He he oper- he operates in this really interesting little tranche. But I mean, so what happened to the guy? I mean, I think he's been very open about this. He got he got a benzo di- di- diazepam, di- benzo a benzo addiction essentially. Um, which I mean, given how famous he became and how crazy that became, I can actually understand that. But I mean, yeah. ironic. But anyway, went to like Russia to get detox, disappeared for a while, and then shows up again. He's still extremely popular. I'm sure he's still making a, a significant amount of money on his numerous podcast shows. I mean, we were kind of chatting about this um, uh, a while ago, but like he is, whether you like it or not, he is the most famous Canadian intellectual in existence today. Yeah. And, and it's not close. Like, you, you know, people want to talk about, I remember having conversations with people about what are the most popular podcasts? Oh, it's it's Canada Land. Oh, it's, blah, blah. it's Jordan Peterson. It's the Jordan mm-hmm. Peterson show so by far it's not even close you there almost is have no... to exclude him from the rankings yeah exactly exactly sense. jordan jordan peterson is so in a class of <clears> his <throat> own right now that he he outstrips any other canadian show intellectual like um academic book right like it's just he is in his own ranking at this point he's a mm-hmm. superstar he's a superstar in every single meaning of the word so that doesn't necessarily mean that his academic work is worthwhile. I, I I don't know. I'm a fucking idiot. I can't assess his academic work and I don't care to. Um, but anyway, that that all aside, I would say it just sort of seems to me like this was somebody who who is was starting to um increasingly uh, enter a kind of weird evangelical phase. He was doing some interesting stuff with Prager University, so he was entering into this very religious, very Christian stuff. Um, and I think that his audience had solidified for lack of a better term, like he wasn't going to grow his audience any larger than it was, but he had a large enough audience in order to sustain the work that he was doing. Yep. And I think that he had kind of um, uh, was starting to pass from the broader, I should say this macro dialogue, so to speak, like Jordan Peterson was just his own thing, starting to do his own thing off in the side. Um, but this particular uh, complaint from the uh, professional association has just been a total shot in the arm for him. I think, yeah, only uh, look again, I don't know. I don't know Peterson. I don't know Peterson stuff. And for anyone wondering why the former National Post comment editor doesn't know a National Post columnist, he was not edited in the comment section. Mm. Uh, I never edited Jordan Peterson. Uh, to no, my he knowledge, was, he was he was in a, he was in a rank above. Right. Yeah. Uh, he was he was not one of my columnists. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Fair enough. Fair I, enough. I, I never had to deal with raw uh, Peterson copy. Um which for the record i maybe it was pristine i don't know like i i literally never handled it so two the two comments i would make about peterson in the general sense one of them is something you and i've talked about before uh we talked about it in the context of lindsay shepherd who mm. was that young canadian woman at mm-hmm. wilfrid Laurier university in waterloo who also kind of to, to use your term became accidentally famous one of the weird things about the social media age particularly culture war figures is the incredible destructiveness of instant fame. Oh, yeah. Which is one day you're like a university, university of Toronto professor. And you're, and you're, you're and a you're big, WLU and you're big. student, yeah. right? Yeah. And the next thing, you are a symbol in the culture wars. And there are millions of people who are lining up for and against you. Yeah. And we should not be shocked when some of these people end up in crisis. Um, oh, absolutely. And you know, all of them do, by the way. And this is what's fascinating. All of the people who who go down this path wind up in a weird, self-destructive place at some point. I kind of feel like in recent years, and it's not exactly me too, but it's kind of adjacent to it. We've had m- more interesting conversations about uh, what happens to the athletes uh, who are mm. like by age seven, you're already a hockey prodigy, right? Like right, you were right. playing on a team with kids three years older than you, yeah. or if you're a child actor or a singer or something, mm-hmm. I think we've had some interesting conversations about that. I wonder if 30 years from now, we're going to have like Oprah esque interviews where you get like a bunch of these people who would have been on ideologically different sides and they're all on the big comfy couch and they're all talking about 
holy shit, that ruined my life for like 20 yeah. years. And then I had to go like raise chickens in Wyoming for a while and then like come Detox back. Detox in Russia. <laughs> yeah. You know, like... So I wonder if there'll be some of that or perhaps by then the culture wars will have simply destroyed us and we'll all be raising chickens because there'll be no other infrastructure left. Hey, I'm, I'm prepared, man. I've, I've looked up how to raise chickens. I'm okay with chickens. that. Uh, the other point I was I was going to make about uh, this in in the particular context of of Peterson and of the the social media, my to my understanding, he's basically right, and I yeah. I don't I think to the point you've made about the how everyone sort of aligned for or against him. This is one of those tricky issues where I, there is almost nobody I trust to wade in as that neutral third yeah. party. And go, whatever you think of Peterson, he's right on the issue. He's wrong on the issue. I, I don't know which one it is. Yeah. I mean, it's us. <laughs> we're we're it. I mean, go back to a conversation we had a couple months ago. It's like we kept on looking around for the adults in the room and, there and realized none. we were the adults in the room. And that terrified us well, we because we're not adults. But we were going to have to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, we, were, we definitely aren't the adults in the room, but we were going to have to pretend to be. I'm, um, I'm, eating, I'm eating a big piece of Toblerone in the I'm, middle of I'm, the podcast. I still haven't taken the gum out of my mouth and I have nightmares about having to go back to high school. Apparently it's us. It's All right. A, that's the thing. We didn't choose it. It Maybe. chose us. The I adult know. life chose us. We just aged into it. Like <laughs> time is relentless. Um, I know. I was, I was a young little shit once too. Yeah. No. And then, and then woke and up one day I'm like, and I'm wait a minute, you young little gray. shits better get yourselves in line. I think uh, the, maybe the only other point I would mention on Peterson, and then we'll just move on because we, we don't want to uh, belabor this. We, we, you, had ta- you said something interesting a couple of minutes ago um, where you talked about how he had sort of become self-sustaining, but mm-hmm. also separate from the mainstream. Yeah. There's a ton of that these days. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And you and I in the line are not entirely not that. Like, oh, no, know, totally. Absolutely. We'd love to have a tenth of his level of financial I mean, success, I, 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 well, obviously, yeah. I mean, I do think that we have a, a, a rope into the mainstream in the sense that I think a lot of the things that we write do wind up becoming mainstream issues or mainstream um, topics of dialogue. I don't think we out of the mainstream. No, I don't, I but, don't think we are either. Like, we I are think... part of the mainstream dialogue, broadly speaking. But um, no, you're right. I, you know, if, if, if the mainstream were the mainstream, what is the mainstream anymore? We're well, totally that's the point. Not... Yeah, yeah like, that's that the point more? I was going towards. There so what's happening is like let's let's assume zero sum, right? There's only mm-hmm. so much bandwidth for conversations, attention, debates, societal dialogue. Whereas maybe once upon a time, ninety percent of it would have been in the mainstream, ten percent of it would have been outside. My guess is right now it's maybe sixty percent in the mainstream, forty percent outside of it in little self-sustaining echo chambers. I'm not I mean, saying necessarily that's, that's a bad thing. I think that's thing. optimistic. I think that's optimistic. I think less less of the conversation is happening in the mainstream. Even that, I would guess it's probably more like thirty percent of the conversation. Well, happening that's the, the point I was going to make. Right? When yeah. does the mainstream stop being that? Stop being mainstream. Like yeah. how small can the mainstream get and still actually be a functional mainstream? And yeah. You know, I, I, I don't like to, to put the past on a pedestal. I'm a historian. I know better than that. Um, but, you know, I, t- I think about like when my parents are growing up and I'm you're, you're just a couple years younger than me. So your parents would be roughly the same age as mine. Or, you know, we hear it, right? There's three channels on the TV. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like in the, we had to turn a knob. That wasn't good because mm-hmm. it froze out alternate viewpoints. It uh, put an upper limit on on diversity, not just of, of of ethnic or religious or gender, but all kinds. So we live in an era where there's so much more choice, and that's a good thing in terms of broader perspectives, diversity, different opinions. But I don't know what the mainstream is anymore. No, that's a good point. And and so when you had said that Peterson, I mean, it's, like, of- it's like it's like it does the mainstream wind up on National News Watch? That's kind of like the Canadian mainstream for me now. To be honest with you. Yeah. Anyway. No, I mean, and you can look at a poll. Like, you know, I've done this. Uh, John Wright and I have done this a few times. You can, I can tell you what mainstream opinion is in Canada because you can look at what the median is. And mm-hmm. then you can look at where the different parties are, relate to the median. So you can get a sense of it that way. But in terms of where conversations happen, I don't know. All right. Um, I don't have a ton on my list. Let me just throw a couple things at you here. One of them is worth flagging, but I don't think 
it's any it's time for analysis yet mm -hmm. so you had given us a little alberta update here's a quick ontario update um apparently the ontario provincial police are looking at whether or not there may have been corruption involved in some real estate development uh, deals involving the Ford government. Ooh, I am that's really, juicy. I'm really dumbing this down. My mm -hmm. Ontario, our Ontario viewers and listeners will know this stuff really, really well. I don't know if anyone outside Ontario knows what the green belt is, but basically there's a swath of land that sort of loops around the greater Toronto area that had been closed to development. And this was to protect uh, watershed, uh, agricultural land, and also to start imposing some limits on urban sprawl. Mm -hmm. And broadly, I've supported this. Um, the, there have been previous adjustments to the green belt where the Ford government, I think I'd have to check that. So Ford people don't get angry at me. But certainly previous liberal governments had basically said the green belt in this particular neighborhood has created an absurdity. So we're taking out a few hundred acres, but we're adding them in somewhere else. So there had been little adjustments along the way. What has been alleged, and I and I would I would speak on this with more authority if I'd followed it closer. So my vagueness is only to prevent me from getting sued and out of ignorance. Um, there's the Ford government has now opened up some significant part of the green belt to development. It, it says it will offset by adding new land elsewhere. So it's not that this hasn't happened before, but this is bigger than it had previously been. My understanding is, and also there seems to have been, these are the allegations lawyers. Are you happy? It has been alleged that, uh, developers with known political or business ties to Ford, his government, and the Progressive Conservative Party all seem to have some kind of psychic precognition of which parcels of land they ought to be buying in the immediate run-up to the announcement of the Greenbelt changes. Mm -hmm. So land that was effectively uh, useless for development purposes was bought up at high prices and then very swiftly was approved for development purposes. So... I don't, I do not know enough to speak with authority on this issue. If the OPP is even considering an investigation, that's worth looking at. So I think I'll, I'll do a quick little note on that. The other thing I, I wanted to talk about is a little bit of a medley of a couple of things. And it actually includes something you were talking about at the start of the podcast here. You had mentioned that the liberals are tired. And I, I think that's true. And I think that's something we've talked a lot about. The liberals are really, really good at politics normally. Their recent conduct and since about last summer, which is when I we wrote for the first time in one of our dispatches, there's something wrong with these guys. They're they're not as good at politics right now as they used to, as, as I expect from them. Even if I disagree with them on policy, usually I look at what they're doing. I'm like, ooh, that's that's clever. Like that's shrewd. Mm -hmm. These guys are good at this. <laughs> Over the last six, seven months, I've been looking at what they've been doing. I've been like, eh. Really, though? Mm, are we sure? And and I think this flows out of, of what we were talking about there. One of the things that I noticed, and this is why it's a bit of a medley, because I noticed it in a couple of places, was that there's been a lot of talk in recent weeks, uh, year-end interviews or New Year interviews, things like that, about misinformation and disinformation from the liberals. Uh, no, I mean, sorry, I should rephrase that. Liberals have been talking about misinformation and disinformation. And I actually share a lot of their concerns about that. Get, just our conversation we were just having a minute ago about what is the mainstream. That's a big part of the reason I worry about this, right? Like I said mm -hmm. to you, there's no one I trust to tell me if Peterson's right or wrong. That is a recipe for misinfo and disinfo, right? Because people mm -hmm. are inclined to believe what they want to believe. <clears throat> so... It's not that I disagree with the liberals, federally in particular, that there is a big, big problem with misinfo and disinfo in this country. What I think is happening is that the liberals are drinking their own Kool-Aid. Yes. And they've gotten themselves in, into a situation where they have correctly identified that misinformation and disinformation is a major problem in this country and, and in the West generally. <clears throat> And what that's letting them do is ignore warning signs. So there's a blinking red light in front of them. And instead of going, oh, we're the government and this is a problem 
and we should probably do something about this they're like oh it's just conservatives talking about it it's it's yeah. just being whipped up by the usual ecosystem yeah and i and i think it's giving them an excuse for failure now many prominent liberals i think it was jerry butts who said years ago that like liberal kryptonite is arrogance they think that they're the smartest and, and the brightest in the room and only they know what they're doing and it makes it difficult for them to realize when they're screwing up. Take that sort of original sin of Canadian liberalism, the arrogance, and add to it a plausible explanation that it's misinfo or disinfo. And I think you have a government that is completely up its own butthole right now yep. and is not capable of perceiving either problems or threats. This is probably a little too highfalutin for explaining some of the government's recent woes. I think a big part of it might, just might be they've been around for seven years and they're tired. Yeah. Like we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel to explain a lot of what we're seeing right now, but this is just one of the things that jumped out at me here. And I, I think I probably will give a quick gun update here. Remember how like six weeks ago, the liberals were like, what we're being accused of is conservative misinfo. Mm -hmm. By the year end interviews, the prime minister was going, yep, we're banning some hunting guns because they're just too powerful. So it took three to four weeks for the liberals to go to these allegations or misinfo to your goddamn right. We're doing it. The story in the Globe and Mail is false. false. So are they too quick to just deflect any criticism as misinfo or disinfo? Yes. And then the other problem that you have here is there's there's again, this goes back to the, the bone deep arrogance problem is that they assume that because there's a problem that they are either the best or only people equipped to fix it. Even if they've created the problem. Even if they've created the problem. Or like, for example, even if even if we, we all concede that, like, for example, disinformation is a problem and misinformation is a problem. Do you honestly think that the liberal government is in any position to fix this? With what no. regulatory powers? And even if you had could come up with the ideal regulatory or policy-based solution, would I trust anybody in this government to administer it? I don't, I don't trust their perspective. I don't trust I, their motivations. And I also, even if I did trust those two things, I don't have faith in their competency. No, exactly. So here, this is, this is, this is one of those issues where it's like, just because there is a problem here, doesn't mean that you can fix it. And that's, and that's actually what I want a government to, to be able to do, but more than anything else, I want a government to be able to acknowledge a problem it can't fix. Yeah. Because sometimes the, sometimes trying to fix a problem can literally only make it worse. And that is what is happening on all of these files. I think that's bang on. Guns, internet regulation. Right. Yeah. It's... But then, then at the same time, you've got a tired government that's trying to cement its legacy after seven years after not having really done very much. So they're trying, to, put their pin, they're I... trying to pin themselves to something. I don't even know if they're worried about legacy. Or I think they're just worried about losing a half point in the 905. Yeah, maybe. Like, I, I think this is a government. I mean, uh, one thing I will say, look, I never make predictions. You know, there's no margin for me in doing that. Do you get the feeling, though, that an election this year is becoming more likely? I think it'll depend on what happens in Alberta. When is that, by the way? May. Yeah, I was talking with some friends about that over the break, uh, and it was pointed out to me that the NDP can't afford an election. They'll prop up the government forever. And I just said, guys, the liberals can trigger the election. Mm -hmm. Like this could, I mean, one of the other wild cards is going to be whether or not we end up having a recession this year. And if we do, how bad? So I think um, I think there's a lot of issues that are just beyond government control, and they're going to have to see where yeah. they go. So I was going to say, inflation is on my list. <clears throat> oh, what? So list? fascinating to me to watch uh, all these the people who were supply side inflationists, inflationists, a year ago saying, "Well, the inflation stuff is just caused by all the the backups and the ports and blah blah blah." No one's saying that anymore. Almost everyone around the, the around the, the around the uh, 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 the economist bend seems to now be conceding that monetary supply is now is is now a factor or mon some combination of monetary supply supply chain triggered by supply chain issues and then just sort of uh, public expectation is now fueling an inflationary spiral or at the very least um, they can't seem to the, the inflationary situation has has, has plateaued yeah. which is good but we now can't can't get it below five percent you know which is still beyond what we would want you know what it's funny uh just a couple of nights ago i was um i was downtown in toronto uh wife kids and toe um near ryerson oh i'm sorry toronto metropolitan 
university there's sort of like um kind of an outdoor food market like you know a bunch mm-hmm. of like food truck stalls where you can get a hot meal and we were downtown and uh everybody kind of wanted something different so that's just a good place to get it one of the things i was just noticing was that like every one of these places like, here, like here's your your burger joint you got your tacos you got your samosas you know like you, et cetera. all of them had rewritten their their signs with, with like to mark up their prices mm-hmm. $8.99 now it's $9.99 mm-hmm. like you can go to this food stall emporium outside Toronto Metropolitan University at Young and Girard just north of Dundas Square and look at all the little stickies of like what the prices actually are now so my my, my colleague Siobhan Morris with uh, CTV in Toronto had a tweet that went big time viral over the break of just it was just like the cost of chicken breasts at Loblaws and hmm. it, like millions of people ended up seeing this tweet that yeah the, the price of chicken at Loblaws tells you a lot but go take a peek at any sort of mom and pop food truck style vendor and how all the prices have been written over in handwriting well not only that don't just look at prices look at shrinkflation it's the other one right like look at the size of the food portions and things like that they're there's yeah. there's quietly being down so uh, inflation is now an issue and now of course the the big concern the big question is whether or not all of these central banks can raise their interest rates enough to stop inflation without tipping this over into a recession and i think increasingly the consensus is probably not we're we're probably in for a nasty time you want to know so, what the real f- okay you're right but you want to know what the real fun wild card is what let's say we get our spending under control probably won't but let's say we no. do Let's okay. say our central bank policies are effective and they're working as well as they could be. Let's assume we have no container ships lined up in long rows at Port of Los Angeles, Long Beach. Apparently a lot of those have been cleared up now, but yep. fine. If China has a real COVID meltdown over the next four or five months, <laughs> supply chains are fucked all over again. Womp, 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 yeah. womp. And this is, you just can't. There's nothing we can do about this. So well, and also the other, COVID maybe another China and COVID in China maybe another interesting little thing to to draw people's attention to, because apparently the um, variant that is now going wild in 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 China is still an Omicron variant. Thank God, yep. so fine. Um, and the reason why it is so bad in China is because they locked down and had a zero COVID policy for so long. They yeah, so it's a naive themselves. population. So you have a completely naive population, and then they haven't actually vaccinated their elderly population to a high enough standard, nor are they using the good vaccines, frankly. So because of a certain degree of nationalistic pride, I presume. So basically it's fucked. Um, And you have this now uh, ultra um, uh, contagious version of the Omicron variant sweeping through. And even though it's in and of itself, it's not a particularly deadly variant. It's, It's not uh, for as far as we can tell, it's not more deadly, de- more deadly than the Omicron variant that swept through Canada a few months ago. But, you know, you've got basically a billion people being infected all at once. So the hospitals are completely borked. Um, and even if it's like a 0.002% in, uh, mortality rate, which seems about reasonable, it's that's still going to kill lots of people <laughs> all at once. So there's, I can't remember exactly what the number is, but it, it's something on the order of millions, hundreds of millions of people are going to get infected by April. For the vast majority, it's going to be a minor flu or a minor cold. But that's, you know, you just, it's so many people that even though it's a nasty, it's it's not in and of itself a particularly nasty illness anymore, it's still going to kill millions. Look, it's the math we all had to learn quickly yeah. in early 2020. A small exactly percentage right. of a big number is a big number. Yeah, exactly. So um, <laughs> we'll see what happens in China. I mean, my question to this is like, okay, so let's say China is basically over this by April. There's another little blip in supply chain stuff. Okay, maybe maybe that gets cleared off faster than we might think. What happens to the political environment, right? Because remember, they only dropped the COVID zero policy like a few after ago. massive protests, riots. riots, unlike anything that China has seen in years, decades probably. So oh. once once you've given a, people a taste of the ability to influence government policy through protests, what happens next, right? So. You, then you add the the uh, inherent financial and economic instability of China, the fact that they're they're sitting on a giant property wave, the amount of money and yuan, like um, cash and yuan that have been pumped into the Chinese economy, in order to artificially inflate the state of their economy. I mean, China could be really bored 
really, really borked here. And we're going to see probably in the next year or two just how borked it is or isn't. So you're that could be even, fun. You're not even looking at the full borking picture. Oh, this is, but this is why I've also ruled out the possibility that Taiwan is going to be an issue at this point. What, what is the new variant risk of turning a billion people into a live Petri dish? Actually, it's not particularly high. Mm. We'll see. Um, I mean, the, we will get new variants, but the probability that any of these variants will be more deadly is probably not high. I'm tired of getting crushed by low probability events. No, I, you, I'm like, like I said, I don't want to make predictions because I'm not making predictions because I know better than that, particularly when it comes to COVID. But uh, I, I would say like it's not something that's key. Like the uh, the probability of a, a of of we there are there are already hundreds of new Omicron variants sweeping through China. There already mm -hmm. that's already happened, but the probability that any one of them is going to be like an R twenty Omicron variant that would be more deadly that's actually not high. The the the, well, the I'm going to hold you to that. Yeah, I well you can. Yeah, it could happen. Of course, it could happen. We could just get really unlucky. I mean, I, I don't yeah, know. I just maybe don't feel lucky. Shit, That's what it comes maybe, down to. Right? Maybe the shit is gonna hit another wet market, and like someone's gonna eat a pangolin or whatever. I mean, mm. I don't know, but uh, the uh, it it wouldn't be the thing that is concerning me. I I am not expecting 2023 to be marked by super COVID. Oh fuck, it's gonna be super COVID, isn't it? God damn it! One of one of the things I've been thinking about, and I don't. <laughs> I'm honestly curious about whether or not this is too navel gazy to be a column. So let me throw this at you. And this is, I'll take your feedback and then we'll, we'll wrap up the podcast. One of the things I've just been curious about, and this comes entirely out of conversations I've had over the holidays with friends and family. Mm -hmm. Just some, some people I haven't seen in a while, like people are traveling a lot more this year and mm -hmm. social gatherings. I think it returned a lot more to, uh, to normal. And we've all been swapping kind of our stories of COVID, right? Like, where were you? you know, we kind of think we've kind of arrived at that phase of it. Mm -hmm. One of a, a headline came to me and it was simply lessons from lockdown. And I don't mean societal lessons. I don't mean cultural or political or financial or economic or public health lessons. What would you do differently if we had another COVID situation coming? Another COVID situation coming. Um... And it's not COVID, right? It's something brand new. It's a, oh shit here we go again. And I think it's an interesting conversation because you and I have talked about this before. I just don't think there's much societal will to do anything. And I, I honestly wonder, even if there was something that was like a genuine civilization killer coming along, can you imagine getting people to put masks on? I, I do think people would respond if, if they felt that the threat were legitimate and existential on an individual level. If like I, I do on think Twitter that it, vomiting okay. out their liquefied organs. Probably. Yes. Yeah. I mean, like, or or I'm trying to say, like, let's something before April, super COVID comes out of China, and it's. I mean, what's really interesting about the China stuff is the Omicron stuff is spreading with an R of twenty between eighteen and twenty, which is insane. Oh, that's, it's that's the most contagious virus ever. We think, especially ever. in the open. Like, yeah, absolutely. Th like this thing moves through the open like norovirus moves through cruise ships. Exactly. Like basically, it is not containable. At an R twenty, you're dealing with a virus that is not containable. At best, you yep. can slow it down, and probably not much at that. Which and is what we were talking sneeze, about. Infects an entire bus. Yeah, or 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 literally worse than that. Even if you are all locked down in your in your in your apartment block, and errant sneeze on the third floor infects <laughs> waves upstairs. Eight, yeah. You know what I mean? Like you, you can't contain that. It's just not containable. Um, so I'm trying to say like, okay, so you've got an R20 version of, of, co of, of COVID with maybe a mortality rate of 2%, right? That's, that's the kind of nightmare scenario because that's the scenario where, okay, there's nothing much we can really do to stop it. And 2% of, of the remaining most vulnerable population is going to, is going to die. And that's, that's, there's no real will or capacity or frankly, even much money for, to deal with it on a social level. So that's kind of the nightmare scenario. But I think that if you had like a super COVID variant with a mortality rate of 10%, I think you would get into real walking dead territory pretty quick. It's because interesting. like nobody's nobody's taken a chance at 10%, right? It's interesting because this is kind of the, the column, if you don't think it's too navel gazy, I might write over the next couple of weeks. On the one hand, I think on the societal front, the economic front, the political front, we're all exhausted. Mm -hmm. but we're all also now lockdown veterans. Like we've all mm. done this before, right? Like mm -hmm. if we have to do this again, there are things I would just do differently. Practical stuff. Uh, I would, I would see, here's the thing is that the thing that got me through lockdowns was um, taking control of my physical environment, making stuff, mm. getting into hobbies. Yeah. 
And I think that I would just uh, be like, okay, I'm not going to pretend to work or I'm going to work as much <laughs> as I as I can. But yeah. like, we all know that at, at height of lockdown, height paranoia, nobody gets any real work done. So let's just move on from that. I'd probably get a chicken coop. I'd do chicken coop. I'd probably dig up much of my gar- much of my yard and I would do vegetable gardening. Mm-hmm. Um, I would, and also the other thing I would do is I would develop better relationships with my immediate physical community. So really interestingly, during during uh, COVID in Alberta, a really interesting underground black market developed where people socialized and traded mm. uh, underground. Basically, well, that, there was, straight the, up yeah, underground. No, look, you could find a black market barber in Toronto if you were so inclined. You could, they were, they were, they were, for what I understand, there were black market bars setting up in like hair salons and yeah, stuff like course. that. Like it was, it was straight up 1930s again. Um, and also communities started to develop to create alternatives to things like eggs and dairy and all sorts of interesting things have started to come out of that. Um, and I think I would probably become much, much more involved in those sorts of black market communities. Firstly, because as a journalist, it would just be fascinating to watch. And secondly, because I think that if I were taking care of myself and my family, more connections to those underground economies would probably become more vital mm-hmm. in a in a more existentially risky scenario. Those are the two things I would do differently. Just more and more hobbies, more and more self-sufficiency, more and more resiliency, uh, ripping up my garden, that kind of stuff. Not only for like the food or whatever, you know, I'm not under any illusions that I'd be able to feed myself out of my you know, tiny suburban garden, but more just because I would need to do phys- do, need to do stuff physically. Wait, you think I should take a swing at this? Not right away. I got some other stuff to write. You think there's a column here? I don't know. To what extent does anyone even want to talk about COVID anymore? Uh-uh. COVID itself, probably not much, but I, th- my gut feeling is that people are probably having the same thought I am on some level of what if I had to do this again? I think, wait, let's wait to see if super COVID emerges out of China. <clears throat> to be honest with you, I don't think, I think that's the, uh, you know what, we can talk about this off the air, but I actually think it's more interesting in the abstract. Mm. Like, I think if it, like, if we actually did have a super COVID coming, I think the column becomes less what if I had to do this all over again so much as it's holy shit. Like, I think it's more interesting as an abstract idea. Like what was, what did you learn? And I, I don't, I'm, that's a rhetorical question. Like mm-hmm. I'm aiming that at the viewers and listeners. What'd you learn about your community? What'd you learn about yourself? What'd you learn about your partner? What would you do differently? Mm-hmm. I don't think that column works in the midst of a renewed crisis, which is yeah, why fair I'm, enough. Okay. like maybe, maybe but I, I don't know. I just, here, I, but maybe I want to sneak that one in before. Yeah, maybe, but the, 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 the same time I would say on the flip side of all of that, bluntly, I, I, I don't think people are talking about COVID at all anymore. Like, I actually think that there's a, there's a, there's a collective amnesia that's starting to take root. People that just want to get it. the Spanish flu too. Mm-hmm. No yeah. And, and, and we knew that this was going to happen when, when the, when the actual um, uh, most acute part of the crisis passed, people were just going to forget it. I mean, I don't know if you've, I found this, but if you were to tell me in detail what I've done over the last three years, I wouldn't be able to give you a straight answer. The last three years have just kind of been, I, I know in, in the concrete things that have happened, you know, my child was born, you know, not one I forgot, but, but I mean, the last three years are for the most part of it, a bit of a blank for me. And I think they are for a lot of people. There, there is a collective amnesia that is taking hold. I don't remember two years of my life after my son was born because we yeah. had two under two. So Mm -hmm. I don't know how much, I mean, I believe you, but I don't know how much of what you're describing is a COVID effect versus a two very young children effect. Maybe, I don't know. It could be. And also like, let's be honest, I basically was dead for the last six months. But um, no, I I honestly think that a lot of people were just blanking out the last few years. Yep. No, I know. Yeah, look. So I, I don't know. If, I don't know. I don't know if a, if, if, an, if a column of that nature is going to be as popular or well-received as other things you could write, but that's yeah, just I my... Just... I could write it elsewhere as well. Anyway. Remember the 1920s pop culture. No one talks about their younger sister choking to death in her own phlegm. Like there is just a blank yep. spot in pop culture in the early 1920s. Yep. Almost no one wrote about the influenza plague. Like, well, this is this is something I was I, I I was very amused by all of the publishers who got keen to to commission these books on COVID. I'm like, by the time it comes out, no one's going to want to read them. Yeah. I mean, they'll be great for future historians, yeah. but no, ain't no one buying a book on COVID in 2023. That's not going to happen. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Well, on, on these cheerful notes, um, so our plan, Jen, is to run a written, oh, we'll probably publish this podcast video tomorrow, mm-hmm. uh, Sunday. 
we're recording this on Saturday, we will have a written dispatch to kick off the return to uh, publishing for 2023. We'll do that Monday. And I think we already have three or four pieces in hand from contributors who also got bored over the break and needed to write something. So I think we're, we're in good shape for the. Yeah. For and I also have a Q and a coming if my Q and a source can ever respond back to me. So hmm. my dude, my dude, anyway, you know, everybody needs a holiday. Okay. Well, on that happy note, welcome to 2023. Yay. It's going to be worse. <laughs> It'll be fine. Everything's fine. We're going to be we're Everything's great. Fine. Relax. Thanks, everybody. Everything's fine. <laughs> See ya. Bye.